Ever wonder just how water travels through a soil profile? Here on Debaco University, we're going to see some cutaways of some soil profiles and see just how water travels through a soil profile, uh, giving some varying different conditions. All right, let's get into how water travels through a soil profile. Well, first off, special thanks to this video here that is uh, provided in information because this uh, is the video where I captured many of the screenshots that we're going to see here uh, presented. So if you want to look at the original, by all means, look at the uh, reference below and look at the direct link there as well. So getting into how water travels through the soil profile, keep in mind that water does travel in a unique way through soil that depends on the composition of that soil and also the potential layers of different soil types that may exist. We're going to see this in a couple examples. Now we're looking at the soil profile in general. A lot of times soil scientists will refer to horizons. The O horizon meaning the organic or very, very top layer here. The A, which is the surface layer. B, subsoil. Uh, C, we're getting down into that deeper areas, typically where roots do not travel and R down here, which is the bedrock. So this is why understanding the type of soil that a grower has is important as it will influence how water it moves through it. Also due to different soil types, this is why what may work for one grower may not necessarily work for another when it comes to irrigation frequency and also duration. So keep that in mind. A lot of it has to do with just how water travels, which a lot of growers really don't necessarily understand. So first off, we want to consider capillary action. So what just is capillary action? Well, kind of it's shown here in this kind of example that we're saying. Capillary action basically is the ability for a liquid to flow in narrow spaces without the assistance of, or even in opposition to, external forces such as gravity. It occurs because of the intermolecular forces between the liquid and surrounding solid surfaces. So what we're looking at here is we see kind of a, see a glove, we see kind of a clear, what looks like a piece of glass, and we see this kind of blue liquid here. Well, what's happening is down at the bottom, there is a blue liquid, and there's actually two pieces of glass. And what the person is doing here is they're pinching those two pieces of glass together. As they make those two pieces of glass tighter, as they're going through and pushing those closer, they're reducing the space and that creating a very small space. And you see pushing here, causing that water to flow against gravity, pushing even tighter, making that space even smaller, there uh, allows that water to travel even further. If the space is sufficiently small, then the combination of surface tension caused by the cohesive properties of the liquid, in this case looking at water, and adhesive forces between the liquid and the container wall act to propel the liquid. And that's exactly what we see here. That space gets smaller and smaller, crushing that together, increasing the height that that water can travel because this smaller space allows the water to move further. So that's what we're seeing here in these images. Now we also have the path of water in soil. So we're looking at just a, a sandy loam, a loam, and a clay loam. And basically we have large particles, medium-sized particles, and smaller-sized particles, at least in a relative comparison. Sandy loams will drain very quickly. The medium-sized loam is kind of that medium-fast drainage, and then clay loam would be the slower drainage. And what we're looking at is those cutaways or those profiles. Now what we're seeing here is we see little droppers, and we're basically simulating a rain event or maybe a drip irrigation, and this would go through in drip water at a very consistent rate. Well, what we're noticing is that the sandy loam over the standard set of time here fully saturates by the end. The loam, we see that slower, and of course the clay loam much more slower to kind of have that water percolate through. What's something we're also noticing in this example as well as others is that water does not travel in a straight line. Water actually slowly kind of cones outwards um, from the original point where it um, hits and comes in contact with that surface. This is why when we're looking at drip irrigation, we can have those drip irrigation lines spaced further apart. And even though the very surface may appear dry, what happens is the coning effect here of the water saturates the area or the root zone. It's a very important concept that a lot of growers uh, forget about or uh, don't fully understand, is that we're seeing this coning effect of that water kind of starts here, starts here, starts here, and starts coning out. And this is how we're able to saturate these uh, root area, the root zone, with the irrigation water. That's so why we don't need irrigation lines right next to one another. They can be spaced out. And that distance will depend on the exact soil type because that's going to affect the degree that that cone will go out.
Now here we're looking at an example. We're starting uh, up here. So we're starting basically right where I am. We have a deep sand layer and how does that impact? So in this case, we have loam, we have a sand layer and we have loam again. So same soil type with a sand barrier and then loam. What we're noticing is we're seeing that same coning effect here. We're seeing that soil starting to kind of go out. Here it's just coming or uh, initially in contact with that sand layer. What we notice with that sand layer is that it actually is a little bit of a barrier. It prevents that water really from percolating through as it normally would. We're seeing here spread out as well as here again. And here we're seeing it definitely continue to spread out. But between the two images between me, we're starting to see a little bit of that saturation penetrate that sand layer. However, once it does penetrate that sand layer, as we see the two images around me now, we are seeing the same coning effect relocating below that area. But keep in mind that here, that top layer is fully saturated. See that spreading out from that uh, single point of entry, spreading out this full area. Then it kind of breaks its way through in that center point, And then we're seeing the coning effect repeat itself again. So it's very important to understand now what the soil type you have this at the top. But if there's a, a different layer there, if there's a barrier there, if there's a different uh, type uh, that occurs, that can really impact the way that this water percolates through the profile of the soil. Now, lastly, uh, in many fields, they have to deal with what's called um, a hard pan. And this is uh, considered the clay layer, as we see here. So we have loam again and loam again. In this case, instead of sand, now we have a clay layer. Consider this to be like a hard pan. And this is commonly found in tilled or plowed fields, where we have that equipment constantly going over that certain depth. And at that bottom, where that scraping occurs, we kind of get a little bit of that hard layer. And we're seeing again, everything starts out very similar in that loam as we would expect it, water's coning out. And then we have water kind of coning out to the point that it then comes in contact with that clay or plow plan layer. Unlike with the sand layer, while we do see that the water is coming in contact and spreading outwards, just as we saw with the sand. However, even after a period of time, we really do not see the water penetrating or percolating through that clay layer. So on a quick look of the profile of the soil, while this hard pan or clay layer looks very similar to this previous one we looked at with the sand, because the properties of sand are very different, the water is eventually able to percolate through after a period of time. However, looking at a hard pan, plow plan layer, or the uh, dense clay layer here, as thin as it may be, in this example, the water is unable to penetrate that. And that's gonna create a pretty substantial dry pocket down here. So hopefully this allows you to better understand exactly how water percolates through soil, regardless of the type. And it's important also to look at your soil profile to see if these any of these layers, though they may be thin, exist, because that is going to impact how water travels through your soil profile. And this can be very important for spacing out drip irrigation lines, understanding this coning properties of the water is very important to ensure you're delivering water to the root zone that you want without over irrigating or under irrigating so you don't run the risk of disease or wasting water.